afternoon. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Melissa Ridgen. APTN kicked off a two-week perspective series this week looking at the child welfare system in this country, the effects that it has on countless children, families, and our communities. So today, we are putting the CFS system in focus. This week and next, we will hear from people who know this system. It doesn't matter where in Canada you are. The child welfare system, um, it, it, many people share the same devastating effects on those involved, doesn't matter where you are in this country, uh, including for some social workers and foster families, believe it or not. Uh, some of what they have to say might surprise you, as you might be thinking that they see things from a completely different perspective that uh, a child or a parent would see things. Of course, this is a call-in show. You can give us a call uh, toll-free, 1-877-647-2786. But you cannot share information about children that are currently in care. You have to keep that in mind if you call. Uh, we have an incredible slate of guests today. A social worker who was fired over the death of 15-year-old Inu uh, teen Wally Rich in Labrador. Uh, a great-grandmother who went on a hunger strike for nearly two months to draw attention to the dysfunction of a system she says is the latest incarnation of residential schools, and a TikTok influencer who uses her huge platform to educate people about the child welfare system. You will not want to miss a moment of this show. Uh, as I had said, APTN reporters have spent months working on stories as part of a two-week-long perspective series on child welfare in this country. Colleen Crozier and Ken Jackson kicked things off this week with a look at why the children of Constant Lake, Constance Lake First Nation, 300 kilometers northwest of Timmins, Ontario, are disappearing. Take a look. They're trying to break my people. You know, I can feel my people and they're hurt. Like I said, I, I, I ride around and I see the empty streets and... And they're hurting them, and it's it's allowed. And the statistics are telling. The number of children apprehended by Kunawanamano has increased significantly over the last few years. According to Bunting, who is her band's child welfare representative, in 2016 there were only two apprehensions. The next year there were four. As of today, Kunawanamano has 37 apprehensions that are before the courts. There has to be a system developed where we can address all the things that need to be addressed, such as the mental health, the addictions, the family support, in order to support families in, in situations like this, even in child welfare. Chief Richard Allen has seen the impact Kunawanamano is having on his community. He still remembers the original vision for the agency and has his own opinions of where they went wrong. With Puno, when we were a partner, we, we thought that we were creating something new and unique. But at the end of the day, from my perspective, they don't care, right? They don't care about our children, our family's well-being, the mental health of the, of the First Nation. It's about what's coming in, there, in my pocket to sustain me, to sustain Kuna Winamano. They're, they're not really pushing the agenda to say, how could I help? Allen says the system as it's operating today is failing his people. And they don't want to recognize what our systems are. They believe their systems are more superior than what our systems that we have to abide by because they say so. Why should we follow a system that we know is already failing. You can watch that story and part two of that uh, in full on our APTN News uh, website. Uh, you can look for APTN's Child Welfare Perspective Series, the whole thing, aptnnews.ca slash truth about child welfare. Well, back in June of this year, the Inu Nation once again called on the government in Newfoundland and Labrador to start an inquiry into Inu children in care. That province promised one three years ago on the heels of a spate of suicides of Inu youth in care. Then this past spring, there was yet another. 15-year-old Wally Rich of Nat Natwashish was in a provincially run group home hundreds of miles from home uh, in Happy Valley Goose Bay. He died by suicide on May 22nd. Soon after, his social worker was fired, but she was not willing to be a scapegoat for a system that she says is in chaos. Linda Sanders joins us now. Hello, Linda. Hi. 
Thanks for taking the time to join with us. You know, this is something I'm, I'm happy to uh, hear from. We don't hear often enough, I guess, from social workers uh, on this show. Uh, agencies tend to just say they're not interested in talking or commenting. And, of course, individual workers, we never hear from them either. Um, so I'm happy that you could join us. And I wanted to ask, you know, you quit social work um, to get your master's in theology. Then last spring, you were approached to come back to social work because they had staffing issues and hassles to do with the pandemic. So you took the job um, and you described when you came back to work, it being like the twilight zone. Can you give us a, an idea of what you faced when you got back to work? Okay, so I, I had an education leave for a year to uh, complete my master's in theological studies. And um, because of the pandemic and because of the shortage of staff, they, my uh, supervisor had asked that I return to work early, and I, I did. And when I did uh, return back, it was, there was basically nobody in the building. And of course, because of the rules that were put in place due to COVID, uh, people were encouraged to work from home. And um, I was also encouraged to work at the office because I wasn't supplied with any type of equipment like a laptop or a cell phone. Um, so I could be more resourceful from my home. Um, and then that's when all the trouble started, I find, because there, because of the lack of support and, and not being able to do my job uh, in a way that I did in the past, I wasn't able to uh, make visits with clients. Mm -hmm. I wasn't allowed to do anything where I could be more um, uh, effective. For them. Well, you had said too that you uh, previously, when you'd worked as a social worker, you typically had a caseload of about 20. When they'd asked you to come back, you were greeted with, uh, you know, file of 40 kind of dropped on your lap in the middle of a yes. pandemic, not being able in to middle. see any of your, the, the kids that uh, whose files you're holding, right? So, can you tell us just briefly, uh, you know, what happened with, with Wally Ridge? So I, I didn't really get to meet Wally. I didn't get to meet him face to face. I didn't even really know what he looked like, anything like that. But I was um, encouraged to make phone calls. And uh, Wally uh, was one of them, of course, just to introduce myself, to let him know that I would be uh, working with him. And when time allowed, I would be uh, meeting with him face to face and hopefully be more effective in helping him uh, for what he needed. Uh, but obviously that wasn't the case. Um, I was back to work, uh, I think maybe four weeks and then things started to get worse. And that happened with and, Wally. Well, and, and then the next thing I know, Wally, um, when, I, when I got back to work after a long weekend, I wasn't made aware until that afternoon that he was, uh, he had suicide ideation, and there were people involved from our department, including uh, staff from the group home that he lived in mm -hmm. and the RCMP. So I received an incident report uh, giving me all the de details of information as to what happened. And I had received no information from any or any direction from any supervisor that was on uh, call at that time or social worker or my own uh, direct supervisor as to the incident or what I needed to do, what next steps. And of course, because of the heavy workload that I had to face, it was doubled. And then having to uh, prepare for court, um, which wasn't something that I was used to. So everything was basically, I felt like it was weighed down so much that I couldn't be effective with anybody. I just had to basically kind of keep my head above water. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. and that was just half days because I had to be, I, I stayed at, at my home and reviewed files in the mornings and then I would return to the office in the afternoon and try to make phone calls, uh, work on affidavits, uh, do whatever else that needed to be done at the office. So um, it, 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 was, it wasn't ideal. How we, long we couldn't be effective. Sorry, how long before, so, so Wally uh, has expressed some 
uh, thoughts of suicide. How long bet before um, that came to reality to, for him? Um, it was when he took his life, it was on the 21st of May. So that would have been on a Friday. Um, it would have been about, I think the, the Sunday before was when he first expressed the, his thoughts of suicide to his mom, who then uh, contacted people from, from the group home. Do you feel that firing you accomplished anything? Uh, no, definitely not. I mean, like, firing me was just a Band-Aid solution to a huge problem mm -hmm. that they didn't address from a previous suicide from three years ago. So obviously they weren't taking it serious enough and they weren't addressing it as quick as they should have because the, the, the lives that these kids have to live in, in under the care of child youth services could be a lot better. Mm -hmm. It could have been, it could have been, they, the care that they needed could have been provided, but obviously that wasn't, wasn't done. You've you've used the word chaos as well uh, in our conversations to describe this this system. You know, and a major criticism that I hear over and over and over, and this is not specific to Newfoundland or Labrador. This is across the country. You know, people are saying, parents and and kids are saying that. Um, Decisions are made by social workers, by agencies, rubber stamped by supervisors and by judges um, without A, you know, caring about the human toll of the decisions that are being made, B, without being culturally informed about what you're doing and the effect that it would have, um, and C, and I've heard this a lot too, you know, these, the people in, this, in this, uh, this industry are often power hungry sociopaths kind of thing. You know, like they, they get off on, on wielding power and tormenting people. You know, you were in this field for a long time. I'm curious when you hear people make assertions like that, what's, what's your re response to that? Well, my first job as a social worker was in the Shashashi. And when I walked into that office building, I felt chaos, the energy of chaos, and just the, uh, just the people that were there that worked there and, um, no structure, no concrete work that needed to be done was being done. We weren't doing justice to the to the families, to the children. Mm -hmm. um, files were always a mess, which is very concerning. Um, I remember one supervisor who always would never really do an investigation, always a removal. It yeah. was always a removal immediately. Like, to me, that is so poor quality management. Mm -hmm. Like you don't take it to the steps or the level where it needs to work with families. You just say, you know, we'll take this child. We have the power and the ability to do it and we'll do it. Yeah. And there's no... And it's like the children are being punished. Oh, the children it's, it's are being so punished true. for that. Is, but there's no mechanism. This is another thing I hear from people constantly. There's no accountability. If somebody, if there's one or two or a handful of workers within an agency who are these power-wielding, uh, you know, remove, 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 um, there's nothing that stops them from doing that. It seems like the supervisors just shrug, the managers shrug, uh, the judges rubber stamp this all. Like, what? What's the fix to this? Well, from my experience, I've been brought to HR for speaking out or doing something that wasn't uh, uh, policy driven. And um, I, think, I think really at the end of the day, they really need to, to see what it is that needs to be done within the communities, not come with this policy that's drawn up in, in some city far away, mm -hmm. but, but and ass assess the the, the communities, look to the leaders in the communities and see what it is that needs to be done in order to make things better for these families. Because obviously it's not being done. It's too complex. And you're sending in social workers, frontline front social workers that have no clue about the communities or families. Yeah. So that that's the biggest thing. The education piece is huge, not in not just within the communities, but at every level, government, every every level. Well, I guess we'll have to see if uh, C92 has any. Uh, people need to get moving on on implementing C92. I guess is the other complaint too. We have to go to a caller here, Linda. Stay with me here. I'm not sure if she's got a question for you or not. 
Uh, who is our caller? Mar Marie from Vancouver, are you there? Yeah, hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to comment, like I, okay, so I grew up in foster care mm -hmm. and I felt like the system failed me. So as an adult, I took a co uh, social work course and I see where the system's so flawed and it's sad that mm -hmm. um, they kind of set us up for failure, um, Aboriginals, low income, and it's written in text. So I just, you know, I just wanted to bring awareness to that, how I they're taught. I think it's interesting that you think, and so many people I hear, uh, you know, were involved with the system, and so they think, I will get into social work, uh, you know, I want to somehow be involved because I saw how bad the system was, and I want to help those in the system. Yeah. And then once you get into it, you realize that you're programmed, they're programming you to do the exact thing that had been done to you. So you're, you have this, like, morphed uh, line of thinking, because I know a lot of kids who were in care who got into mm -hmm. this industry thinking, I want to help keep families together and now they're the ones that are up there taking kids. Yeah. Interesting well, I how that works. It was so troubling that um, just it, it was it was like lack of empathy in text. And I was like, okay, this, and it was kind of racism. Yeah. You know, I felt like there was so much racism to low income and single parents and aboriginals that, you know, and I just, I just um, graduated my course. So this was just last year I was reading this and being taught this. And it was just, it was sad. Even the instructors were bothered by it. <laughs> so Get in yeah. there, get working, get your elbows up and fix it. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> I'm doing certain things to help the community right now and I'm good. very, you know, very involved. So well, good luck and I hope you don't get you don't get dragged into becoming part of the problem like we keep seeing happening. It's like at some point I think maybe there's a there's a collective awakening a little bit more now where uh, you know, people don't get into it and necessarily become part of the problem. There's enough people who want to go in and, and make change. Um, just very yeah. quickly, Linda, I wanted to ask you, you know, are you going to return to social work? Not in that type of work. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to deal with those types of departments. I want to be able to get in the community myself mm -hmm. and uh, work with people one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not really sure what that's going to look like right now, but I will definitely because it's needed. You need to have good, good social workers, even like this, this individual on the phone says she grew up in the system. We need people with experience at all levels. Yeah. So I encourage you to continue on. Oh, we're going to keep going. Don't you worry. You keep fighting too. Linda, thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure to talk. It's so just unfortunate. It was such an awful topic that we, uh, it was a child's death that, um, you know, kind of we had to discuss here with Linda. Um, we did email the uh, Newfoundland Labrador government and had uh, laid out a bunch of the uh, points that Linda was making. Uh, we asked them to respond. We asked what's happening to the inquiry that they promised three years ago. They said that that was going to happen in 2020. That obviously isn't going to happen. Um, we just moments before stepping in the studio here, I got an email back finally a couple days later, and they said that they uh, will get us a response. They have some answers for us. So I encourage everybody to check out that. We'll include that uh, in the web story that we do on this episode of In Focus. We have to take a break, do we not? Yes, we have to take a break. When we come back, though, uh, a hunger-striking grandma with wise words about the need to retake control over child welfare. And she's not talking about Indigenous-run agencies that are often part of the problem. She's talking about getting back to natural Anishinaabe law. And later, the incredible TikToker, <laughs> Fiona Moore. She is using her platform to educate the public about this industry. She's incredible. If you haven't seen her, you're going to want to. Stay with us. From 2005 to 2019, $338 million was taken from the Children's Special Allowance. It was the excess money every year that was just dispersed and allocated to whatever government funding they needed that year. Um, Section 84, Bill 34 was just being fought and it removes the right to sue the province. It allowed the government to bypass the courts and justified the theft of the Children's Special Allowance from First Nations children. Section 231 of Bill 2 was just passed on November 6th, this past Friday, and it specifically legislates away the rights of Indigenous children to sue the government for the children's special allowance owed to them. I say First Nations because predominant children in care are First Nations. And yeah, they did make money off of our children. Join our conversation now. Call in toll-free at 1-877-647-2786 like us on Facebook on our APTN News page, 
Follow or tweet us at APTN in Focus and send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. Welcome back. Let's go to social media now with our social media editor, Jesse Enders, to hear what some of you are saying about today's topic. Thanks, Melissa. Leading up to our perspective series, APTN journalists Kenneth Jackson and Cullen Crozier have been sharing stories online about child welfare in Northern Ontario. We received a lot of feedback on those stories. Let's take a look at some of the comments. First from Karen, they won't work with parents to get their children back. The longer in care they are, the longer these workers have a job. Sandy asked, I don't understand how and why this is happening and does anyone face consequences for keeping children from their families? Michelle said, Government has been doing this crap for years. They still think our children can be turned white. Too bad they don't give $1,500 to parents instead of foster children parents. There would be less taking away and more investing in the kids. From Richard, sounds like the modern day version of a residential school. Rosalie said, Why, if we can put a man on the moon, can we not fix kids from broken homes and help them grow and become strong in their own bodies and minds? Lastly, Gary asked, Time after time, I read how children care services are exaggerating just for the money. Isn't anyone doing anything about these money-hungry organizations? Thank you all for sharing. If you want to see more of our perspective series, visit aptnnews.ca slash truth about child welfare. If you want to add your opinion to our topic, here's how. Join our conversation now. Call in toll free at 1-877-647-2786. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN in Focus. And send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. Thanks to all of you who shared those comments and to those of you watching on our Facebook live feed right now, uh, making reiterating those exact comments. Well, watching child welfare agencies destroy children, parents, and communities for a long time, an Eagle Lake First Nation gra great-grandmother finally had enough. She went on a hunger strike, surviving on fish broth and tea for more than 50 days, demanding that leaders get moving on reclaiming jurisdiction over their children and families. Bill C-92 hands over control of child welfare to communities and nations out from under uh, federal or provincial rules if they want. But Brenda Morrison says it's been nearly a year and there's been far too little action. I talked with her from Eagle Lake earlier this week. So Brenda, on day 50, you had stopped your fast, uh, started moving to pureed food and juices and water with electrolytes. Can you tell us, you know, what was the physical and the emotional journey like for you, uh, the impact for you for almost three months of being on a hunger strike? Well, physically, when I started this uh, hunger strike or intense fasting on October 9th, 2020, and ended um, on Friday, November 26, 2020, at five, five o'clock. I um, there were times where I was very weak because I have uh, type two diabetes as well, and uh, I suffered uh, the diabetic um, symptoms. And uh, physically, I uh, I was at times very hungry where you know I, I had cramps and I had there was numbness in my body that was the physical symptoms mm -hmm. um, mentally I was in um, I was very focused emotionally I I asked myself times why I was doing this what was going to be the outcome of me what was going to be the outcome of the children the, is this going to be, you know, is this going to continue even after I, I uh, come out of the fast? But I think my my biggest strength was my um, was my um, spirituality mm -hmm. and the guidance from um, you know the grandmothers across this country, uh, the children across this country that have uh, that lived in the 
child welfare homes throughout their lives and their be them being parents themselves mm -hmm. and how this impacted their family system mm -hmm. throughout their lives so that kept me going and uh, throughout this fast I would say that I I I was very strong but in the mental emotional and spiritual aspects but physically I noticed that my body was starting to get weak in a lot of areas. You had a lot of support from people. You'd said this kind of snowballed quickly on social media. Uh, lots of sharing of the, the posts of your journey. You would post every day. Uh, can you share with us some of the, you know, who stepped up and took note of what you were doing and why you were doing it? It was um, the, at first it was the people that had gone through the system. Uh, the peop uh, people that were going through, you know, uh, currently having uh, issues with the system, P uh, parents that have children in care. But I was really, um, I was really supported by the women who had children in care. Mm -hmm. And I often asked them questions about what was working and what was not working when uh, their children were apprehended. And what did they have to say? And um, they said that, you know, they, they knew of a lot of women that, and including themselves, that they felt that their, their, um, their children, their families were broken. Mm -hmm. They were broken and never ha saw hope in repatriation with their, fa with their children. And uh, this was many women, but I also heard from the grandmothers that believe in um, the Anishinaabe Abinoji Nafini Gawin, which is child, you know, our uh, child, child welfare law. Mm -hmm. And uh, they gave they gave me lots of uh, support. One of the things that one of the ladies said was, our child welfare law, Vishnabi and Nafinigayawin, was. Um, was was given to us by the creator and it was taken away from us by the residential school mm -hmm. the 60 school our current child welfare agencies that are operating you know under under the child welfare legislation and even this newly um newly new bill bill c92 we had our child welfare laws way before any of these laws. We, it was given to us by the Creator from time from time in memorial, as I, I, I would say. So that kept me going, that I knew in, intuitively, innately, that we have, Anishinaabe people have, our own Anishinaabe Abinoji Nakhnigiri, all through this country. Um, you know, you've been critical of First Nations for foot dragging, uh, you know, with C92 being rolled out last year. Uh, you've been critical of First Nations not taking control under that legislation and running with it to get back to, as you said, the, the traditional laws. Um, you know, how, how would this work? How do you see a transition happening? How, how, sh how can we move back to those traditional ways that you're talking about? Well... We have to really define or, you know, really come together as a people in our communities and um, recognize that the current child welfare system has, will not work and it has never worked. And we need, we need um, to, to come together and understand what we've been working under when we, uh, when, when the um, indigenous child welfare services operate under, you know, provincial legislation, mm -hmm. we need to know that we need to know that we come from a different worldview, a different lens. We come when um, we come from, um, you know, our child welfare laws 
are are given to us by the Creator. Mm-hmm. And you know, we come from a collective view, collectivism view of, of our people, our natural laws, and that that includes our Nishnabe and Nafnigayin laws. Mm-hmm. Whereas um, I'm trying to. Um, you know, uh, give the difference between our way and uh, the non-indigenous way. Now, the the concept of the best interests of the child has always been bothersome for me. And when I did some research on it, it, it comes from, it's a British concept that was enforced on us Anishinaabe people. When you think about the residential schools, mm-hmm. you know, the 60s school and, um, you know, the current uh, um, child welfare agencies that, that is enforced upon us right now. And also the Bill C-92, like th- those those um, concepts or those laws are not ours. Right. And I, when, when you when you ask me that question, the, the the leadership, the communities, the agencies that operate under these guidelines, they're adopting to um, um, laws that are not ours, and they keep trying, and they keep trying. Mm -hmm. And why do we keep trying to make something work that has never worked for us? Right. So what do you what so, do you do for kids who are in need, you know kids that are, are are living in homes where they are not safe they can't stay there like you know what's what's the answer to that I mean these agencies all will tell anybody who listens oh we only go and take kids as an absolute last resort it's only if they're at risk of you know significant harm or death which you and I both know isn't true there's a lot of kids that are taken that are not uh, taken for because they're under uh, you know a significant th- uh, threat of anything um, but on paper you can twist anything to look like that but that being said there are still kids that legitimately authentically are in homes where they aren't safe how does traditional law affect that like do you, under a, a traditional system that you're talking about would those kids be apprehended still how would this all work if we had our own um, resources in the first nation communities and we had our own uh, meaning you know um, the staff and um, the human resources and the financial resources, we would, we would, um, you know, through our own, our own uh, natural law beliefs, cultural beliefs and values, uh, which includes everyone in the community, including, um, you know, the the relatives, the friends, the community, the community membership that aren't related necessarily to the to the child they would step up to the plate and um, and uh, take care of that child if that child was at risk by the parents in the community mm-hmm. but when you when you um, when you take it ch- this to me is um, workable it's doable and it's been passed down and uh, we got to get back to that in rather than you know uh, call an outside agency to, to apprehend the child mm-hmm. and we know what happens after the child is apprehended they lose they lose uh, their connection to the community mm-hmm. they lose their connection to to their identity their cultural um, beliefs and values uh, some some children out there including my own they don't even know that they're native people Anishinaabe people mm-hmm. And, and this uh, is, and your your family is dealing with uh, an Anishinaabe agency, right? This isn't, you know, a white agency that's come in and do it. But you, like you pointed out before, they're working under a, 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 a non-indigenous framework. It might be indigenous people that are that are the foot soldiers of it, but it's still they're foot soldiers of a non-indigenous framework of an entity that is what you're saying is part of the problem. Yes, that that's a big problem. Uh, and um, as far as I know, that there's eleven. Uh, uh, native agencies in Ontario that are operating under the child welfare law, and uh, there that is why there is an overrepresentation of our children in, in care right now because oh 
this law. If we 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 um, we had the human resources and the financial resources to develop our own Anishinaabe, Abinongi, and Nakunigewin, there would certainly be less. I really believe that there would be less children in care. Mm -hmm. They would be communities with their mother, their mothers, their parents, their grandparents, and 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 so on. I would be getting those supports. Yes. Well, the money is there now. I mean, I, I guess hypothetically, there is a 400, or sorry, $542 million last week. Prime Minister pledged uh, to go to communities to implement um, child welfare systems under that umbrella of Bill C-92. What do you want to see done with that money? I think that um, they have to build um, capacity in the community, meaning the, the human resources and uh, the financial resources as well. The Bill C-92, from what I understand, has no money in it right now, and it's, it's, that's hollow. There's nothing in it. And what I would like to see is um, our leadership take uh, a solidarity approach and um, go back to the table and uh, fill out, you know, yeah. you know, uh, fill, fill, uh, ask what the what the needs are tell them what their needs are to fulfill this uh, bill c92 which means giving jurisdiction to our our um, our first nations people in mm. the community breaking free from those those provincial um rules and regulations yes brenda i thank you for taking the time today to talk with us and uh, much admiration for you to go through what you went through for that uh, many days, 50 days, and still counting, just slowly reintroducing solid foods to your diet. Um, I wish you all the best, and I hope that we never have to talk about this again. Hopefully it's, uh, you know, in a perfect world, we'd see some changes be made. Certainly the system isn't working as you, as you pointed out. Thank you for having me. Mm. And I, hope, I, I just want to say one more thing that, um, I just want to say that um, the system that we're, we have our children in now will never work and it has never worked mm -hmm. and i would like to the change that i would like to see is you know that our uh, leadership and our agencies quit making newer new rela relationships agreements with the province mm -hmm. and uh, let's let's look at a different option and if these op options need changing well let's make those changes yeah that's what i miigwech for having me on uh, in this uh, program yes miigwech brenda thank you we gotta go to another break when we come back anti-cfs TikTok sensation fiona moore the last residential school closed in 1996 the birth alerts policy came into effect not long after no one can exactly say how many on-reserve children are in the child welfare system. No one has ever been able to say because it's never been tracked. is a Winnipeg mom and educational assistant who started TikToking back in September, posting tips for people battling CFS, educating the general public about how this industry destroys lives, and not just uh, about taking kids from parents who can't parent, like these agencies and workers would have you believe is always the case. In two short months, Moore has amassed nearly 25,000 followers interested in what she's posting about CFS. And she joins us now from Winnipeg. Fiona. <laughs> Hi. You know, I discovered you about a month ago. I adore the TikToks that you post. I love your matter of fact style. Uh, you know, why, you know, you chose to, to, to cover, to tackle something heavy like child welfare when a lot of TikTokers are like, you know, shaking their booty or hawking lipsticks. Bizarre choice, but we appreciate it. Why'd you pick CFS? Well, I actually initially started my TikTok platform to prove a point to my teenage daughter <laughs> that you didn't have to shake your body and show off things to amass followers. I didn't expect it to be this big, and I didn't expect it to go in this direction, but um, 
people just wanted to talk about it. And so I researched more and I kept producing what people wanted to address. Yeah. And are you, is your your base obviously isn't just in Manitoba. I mean, you're based in Manitoba, but do are, are there people from across Canada into the United States, other parts of the world? I think the last time I looked at my analytics, the predominant followers are from uh, the states. I have 56% Americans and um, wow. something like, yeah, 40% Canadians, and then the rest are scattered. Um, I want to show our audience uh, one of your TikToks. Uh, let's look at one that explains the options that exist under Bill C-92. It's nice and boiled down. Did you know Bill C-92, Section 20, that was passed as of January 2020, allows bands to exercise jurisdiction over child and family services. It can be done with any band, and it affirms our inherent right to self-govern and take back control of our children on and off the reserve. Entails developing our own legislature and sending a notice to the Minister of Indigenous Services. Now, it allows us jurisdiction over our child and family services, but it would not prevail over any other laws, provincial, federal, or territorial. The second option is as a band, develop our own legislature, send a request to enter into our tripartite agreement with Indigenous Services Canada and any relevant provincial and territorial governments agreement has to be agreed on within a period of 12 months but it allows our laws to prevail over provincial territorial or federal this can be done with any band but it's going to need cooperation and coordination what's the most common feedback that you get from your posts despair heartbreak um, parents that are absolutely helpless it's a helpless feeling having your child um, in this system and so many obstacles set against you and that's why I try to look at it from different perspectives. Um, I've tried to look at it from the common law aspect, I've tried to look at it from bans taking back their rights through Bill C-92. I'm just trying to look at several different avenues to change this system. You know yourself, just the nightmare of dealing, like so many people do, the nightmare of dealing with CFS and specifically how they approach Indigenous people. You know, what's your, what yes, was your takeaway from that? Um, you know, thinking about it last night, I've actually had over 20 years experience dealing, being on the receiving end of CFS. Um, I watched my brother grow up in the mm -hmm. system he was taken away for anger problems and allegations of abuse that were never proven, mm -hmm. and I stayed behind. And then 10 years as a parent. And yes, being a single parent, mm -hmm. it is a reason for them to target you, but there was, there was never any investigation. Um, their first approach is a very child-centered approach. They, their first response is apprehension. They, mm -hmm. We need more supports. We need more help for our for our addictions, our mental health issues. You know, clean water is already a huge obstacle that mm -hmm. affects a lot of parents on reserve. And mm -hmm. so there's all these obstacles already set up that they need to address. Well, there was the obstacle set up. I know just in talking with you, the fight, it wasn't just you versus the system trying to get your child back for, you know, being improperly apprehended for uh, over a year, well over a year. I think it was like over a year and a half. There was other people, school principals. You had multiple support uh, people who came out. It's like, you got the wrong, the, the wrong people here. Like, this is ridiculous. Return her kid. And that, did you get a, a feeling that that system just, once they have their little hooks in, they aren't giving that child back, come hell or high water? Because I hear this from a lot of people. No, and once you have your your court date and once you have to go through the judicial process judges don't listen to what parents have to say no i wrote five thousand words uh in response to my daughter's allegation and i had a principal i had her doctor i had everybody trying to help me and yeah. all they wanted to do was look at it felt like they wanted to just look at my daughter as a paycheck it was mm -hmm. <sighs> sorry no, I understand how you feel. That's trust me. I've lost. I've shed enough tears on this these files myself. So I know how you feel. And I didn't even lose a child to the system. So I know how you feel. You have her back though now. Things are things are good now. 
Yes, as of September 16th, we got her back, and that's when I really went full force with this. Yeah. Um, before I officially got custody of my daughter, I was just making vague, um, vague mentions of systemic racism. I never went so hard and so fast at them as when I finally got my daughter back, and then I was fully convinced that absolutely what they did to me was wrong. Um, hearing stories from my daughter and how hard she fought to get back to me, just as hard as I fought to get her back. Yeah. Um, the damage is irreparable. I don't know if I'll ever be able to fix it. And we were both absolutely stunned that okay. if this happened to us, who else did this happen to? Sorry, my mic. Okay, well, Fiona, I want to take a look at, and I love that it's like, you know, looking back on this, they obviously picked the wrong person. Like, you plowed through, you got your daughter back, you guys are fine, you're, you're healing from this, but you're not just quietly healing. You're telling 25,000 other, 25, other people, here's the issue, and laying it all out for them. I want to share with uh, our, our viewers uh, another TikTok. You've got tips for if CFS comes knocking at your door. Common law way of beating them at their own game. When CFS comes to your door, record if possible. As well, ask them their full name and ask if they have ID to prove that they belong to an agency. Third question, do you claim this child is your property? Do you claim to have the power to administer property without right? For them to actually prove these two questions to be answered as yes, they would have to expose the number one trespass that has occurred against all of us from the day we were born, our birth certificate. A non-contract, non-consensual agreement that binds you to civil procedure. If they say yes to these last two questions, ask them if they're willing to sign under these statements. Write up a contract, also known as a notice of liability, with an optional fine. You can then file a claim against them, also known as a private prosecution, where you file a trespass claim with evidence provided against said woman or man by yourself, another woman or man, using common law court de jure jurisdiction by jury, also called due process, to move for your claim our public courthouse and seek justice. Do you get some hate mail from social workers? I do, um, <laughs> but I get a lot of, message of messages of support as well. So yeah. people are entitled to their opinion, and I just usually explain my side, and if they are still willing to be ignorant about it, then I block them. <laughs> um, I had said to, you know, I get a lot of um, feedback from social workers and a lot of it is negative and it's always from like fake um, accounts. Nobody puts their name on it. Like they just create burner emails accounts so they can email you and tell you how awful you are and whatnot. And I've never been able to understand this. If I was in a profession where people were governing themselves like this and I was one of the good ones, I would love that somebody's calling out the ones in my profession that are pulling this crap, right? I, I just I can't get my head around, uh, what, you know, the motivator here. Um, I, I love this other TikTok too about um, you had talked about making this about the agents and not necessarily about the agencies. What uh, what do you mean by that? What what what's the wisdom you would impart to people? Well, my initial my initial research into common law was that. Agencies aren't necessarily, we aren't necessarily able to hold agencies responsible for their actions. Lawsuits against agencies in the past haven't been very successful. Mm -hmm. So that was my angle, was trying to hold an agent themselves responsible for their actions. Like I said, several different avenues I've been looking at, and this was just um, one of them. Uh, where can people follow you on TikTok? Throw us your handle. It's Miss Moore, you know. <laughs> um, very quickly, uh, you want to start up a, 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 a lawsuit. People can get in touch with you through your TikTok if they're thinking about, let's try again, class action lawsuit. Uh, it doesn't matter where you are in Canada. People want to start having that conversation. Fiona's going to lead it. Thanks for joining us, Fiona. I'm so thankful for the work that you do on this, and I'm so pleased that your TikTok has taken off like it is. It's such an important issue. Well, thank you so much for having me.
APTN's Perspective Series on Child Welfare continues all week and next week face-to-face -face and nation-to-nation, -nation, and APTN Investigates are all dedicating Thank their you. coverage to this issue. Be sure to check them out. We will be back here next week right here on Wednesdays with a foster mom uh, who may quit fostering after what she endured at the hands of CFS workers. We've got a Calgary mom locked in a battle to get her sick kids out of care while an agency has her assessed by psychologist after psychologist after psychologist saying she's unfit to, or they're saying she is not unfit to parent. Anyways, lots next week for you right here on In Focus next Wednesday. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Thanks for joining me. Have a great afternoon.